Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming this early morning for a discussion of regulation and regulatory cooperation, which is uh, well, breakfast of champions, of course. Um, very, very glad to have all of you here. Um, but most of all, I'm very glad to have Minister Anita Nan with us. I know some of you are Canadian and will know her by reputation, but she started like Clark Kent, a mild mannered law professor, <laughs> entered government, was given the job of public works and procurement right before COVID, and then had the responsibility of getting Canada everything from ventilators to vaccines, uh, making sure PPE was available, completely revamping the, um, the Canadian health system. And she delivered. It was a tough time. If you were around then, you'll remember just how tense it was. She was able to deliver across the board. She then moved on to national defense, where she uh, she had an immediate task of cleaning up some uh, misbehavior by uh, you know from officers. But then um, surprised us all by cutting the Gordian knot of the F thirty five purchase, moving a lot of very important, very large projects forward. And if and when. Canada reaches 2% of GDP spent on defense as the Prime Minister has pledged, it will largely because of the decisions that Anita Nan made in office, because it takes a while to get delivery, but she made sure the purchase was made. Then, Prime Minister asked her to take on the Treasury Board Secretary of Canada, and some of you will know it's the only part of the cabinet, which is actually named in the Canadian Constitution, is the Management Board of Government, and that's something like OMB, Something like uh, GSA sometimes, you know, kind of managing the way the, the government operates. It's a big remit. And she has made one of her signature issues, regulatory cooperation. I know a couple of you, Richard Sanders in particular, will remember the old Regulatory Cooperation Council, which we had during the Obama administration. During the subsequent administration, uh, it fell apart didn't really meet, and so it has been revived. It's a very exciting uh, development. I'm a huge fan. Um, so with that, let me, um, let me ask you to talk a little bit about, about it, about where you are, and where do you think the Regulatory Cooperation Council can go? Well, thank you, yes. Chris, and first of all, thank you for arranging this mm -hmm. and having me here, and I'm sure you all know uh, what an expert Chris Sands mm -hmm. is in the regulatory space. So it's just an honor to have this conversation. So we can share it with all of you. We'll learn a lot about staffing in the next few days. That's my chief of staff. That is my press sec, Maya Tomasi. So do the thing that my mom always does, which is kind of spitting my hair. Before we um, so I come to an educational institution, honestly, as uh, Chris mentioned, having been at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law for uh, 13 years and Queen's Law School in Kingston, Ontario for six years. And I did a sabbatical at Yale and Cambridge. So I love uh, higher education. I love universities and I love teaching and speaking with uh, students and anyone interested in learning. So just being here today is great at this wonderful facility. Uh, so in terms of regulatory cooperation, you're exactly right. It has been one of my main focal points, even though the Treasury Board of Canada is responsible for $450 billion per year of federal expenditures in terms of getting those expenditures yeah. out the door. So that's the official task of the Treasury Board to oversee those expenditures and make sure that we are managing taxpayer dollars prudently. In addition to that, however, especially at a moment when we need to make sure that Canada-US relations remain strong regardless of the outcome of the November election, I said, what is it that we have in Treasury Board that we can utilize ourselves to further and enhance the relationship between Canada and the United States? And lo and behold, the Regulatory Cooperation Council formed in 2011 uh, between uh, President Obama and Prime Minister Harper is the signature Treasury Board vehicle, if you will, where we can work on aligning regulation between our two countries. And so uh, once I recognized the existence of the RCC, I 
he did ask, you know, why haven't I heard about the RCC before? And that's because it has been consistently operating at the level of officials, but ministers from time to time take up the cause, but some ministers don't. And I am moving to not only champion the cause of regulatory cooperation between Canada and the US um, myself, but I want it to be sustained. So regardless of who is occupying the chair as treasury board president, we need to make sure that the alignment between regulation between our two countries remains as uh, consistent as possible. And the reason is because we need to lower the cost of capital. We need to increase the revenue base for Canadian businesses, large and small, so that they can grow their businesses, so that they can hire more workers or utilize that additional revenue in the way that enhances their business. I've read some of what you've written from your law school days. And when you talk about regulatory burden, people think about fees or what it costs just to, yeah. to pay for this. Mm -hmm. But there's also a time cost to regulation uh, in terms of the speed with which a decision is made. And also from the government side, how many people's salaries you're paying to spend how much time on a particular file. It, it, is that something that RCC can do across the board? Uh, try to aim at that, almost the productivity of the public service and how... Uh, how quickly we're able to make good decisions, not race to the bottom. So that's a really good question too. Um, we have to think about the overarching purpose first and foremost of regulatory alignment. And we've talked about this, Chris. Um, I ideally would like to see something akin to mutual recognition in place. The concept of mutual recognition is, look, we have two different systems of government, different legislative processes, different administrative bodies. And it is somewhat inconceivable to, to imagine a world where all of our regulations are identical. But we know that we have similar goals, consumer protection, for example. So how can we align our regulations to deliver the same thing? And that is what mutual recognition is. Mutual recognition says, from a Canadian perspective, we will recognize US regulation as being applicable and useful. And therefore, if you're complying with US regulation, that is sufficient for Canadian purposes and vice versa. So we actually already have a form of mutual recognition in place in the financial markets area. In the capital markets area. I taught in this, this area for, as I said, 22 years. And the mutual jurisdictional, multilateral jurisdictional recognition system is an example of that. Um, respecting the rules of mm -hmm. another country. So if there's a cost of inspection or whatever, you can have your own government, the one you know best, do the approval. Mm -hmm. And for a small and medium-sized business, that I always think of them, this is a huge advantage because I know small and medium-sized businesses always complain. They don't want another page of tax forms to fill out. They don't have deep staff. So they want to make things as simple as possible. So if you're able to align regulation through mutual recognition, small and medium-sized businesses stand to be the best, the biggest gainers because they're the, also the biggest complainers, but you're able to get them approved for 300, 400 million people all in one go? Well, Canada specifically has much to gain from a system like MJDS or mutual recognition. And the reason is that we have a preponderance of small to medium-sized businesses in our country, and those businesses tend to go public um, early, earlier than most. So setting up a system that actually addresses the need to allow these businesses to grow is fundamentally important. And you might be thinking, you know, let's hear some examples. What are you talking about, uh, Anita? <laughs> and one example uh, that I often utilize is cross-border, crossing the border. If you're a trucker, and you're carrying goods across the border and you have different rules for filing your manifest on either side of the border, 
is that time consuming? Is that costing you and your business more money to comply with two different sets of rules where the information that you're providing is essentially the same? So we want to try to align, smooth out those costs, those extra costs for businesses that don't make sense, where the goals are the same. And that's a perfect example. I've talked to regulators back in the old RCC, original RCC days during the Obama administration, who were actually very protective of their regulations. And the hard thing was getting them to break with the path dependency. We've done this this way for a long time. That's how we like to approach this problem. How do you get a culture of regulatory cooperation going, where people are really willing to have a conversation, share, and maybe accept that the other side does something better? So you have been reading my stuff from when I was a prop because <laughs> when I was a prop, I used to write about how we've got to think about implementing regulation at different levels. So at one level, you have the actual regulation, but simply because you have the words written on paper doesn't mean that you're actually going to be able to achieve the goals of that piece of paper you actually have to engender a culture of compliance and a culture of ensuring that there will be that recognition in place and that norms-based culture takes time to evolve. However, we have a extremely strong relationship with the United States, especially in the area of trade and economic cooperation, $3.3 billion of goods and services cross the border every single day. And so what the RCC seeks to do is to maintain and enhance that trading relationship and to address some of these issues before they get to the level of a trade dispute. And the RCC is a perfect vehicle for that because what we've seen over the years is success stories in the RCC. Air conditioners and efficiency in those types of products have yielded $1.5 million back to manufacturers as a result of regulatory alignment. So that's just an example of the benefits of ensuring greater and greater cooperation and recognition of rules between the two countries. There was a phase I remember in the um, George W. Bush administration um, where we were working on the Security and Prosperity Partnership for North America. I think that was under Paul Martin's government initially and, and then under Harper. And in that mode, we were trying to do regulatory cooperation on a trilateral basis, including Mexico. And now under Obama, there was a separate Mexican regulatory cooperation effort and a Canada-US one as well. How... How well do you think U.S. and Canada can, because we have some similar language and culture, can we can we be the pace setter here and and maybe move faster together than we could trilaterally? Because that was one of the criticisms of SPP. We weren't moving fast. Mm -hmm. The U.S. Canadian partnership mm -hmm. on so many things works very well. NAFTA is the key example, but. There are, as I said, businesses that work cross-border every single day to the tune of $3.3 billion per day. We have the longest undefended border in the world, which facilitates the movement of goods and services. During the pandemic, I saw firsthand the way in which our two countries were able to cooperate terms of PPE deliveries, in terms of vaccine procurement. So the strength of the RCC comes not only from the mandate for mutual recognition and regulatory cooperation, but also utilizing that strong U.S.-Canada base. And so my preference is for it to continue in this way. And of course, the North American uh, trade agreements that are going to be negotiated every 10 years are another facet of ensuring North American cooperation. 
I know um, one of the things that also can work with mutual recognition and with these kind of efforts is where we burden share uh, from your defense days, but where the, the we may share test results or we may have peer review of each other as we're trying to get products through. Are there ways in which cooperation can actually lower the cost to government of maintaining regulatory systems or surveillance to make sure mm -hmm. compliance is in place? So as part of this initiative, reviving the RCC, I have gone across Canada and in some US cities as well to meet with businesses and organizations to hear their viewpoints. Vancouver, Winnipeg, Windsor, Ottawa, Halifax, Chicago, DC, those are some of the areas I've visited to speak with businesses and other organizations. And we are hearing exactly that, that they would like to see uh, regulatory cooperation for governmental approvals as well. And certainly when I have spoken with my uh, US counterparts uh, in her office, she has been very willing to have this conversation. I will say that that is low hanging fruit if you're already working in government to be able to see how we can be more efficient in terms of regulatory approvals. I will say that Health Canada and the US FDA already work closely together on approvals. We saw that certainly during the pandemic with the sharing of approval information, clinical trial information for vaccine approvals. <clears throat> and so we have a strong foundation in terms of burden sharing uh, from a governmental standpoint, and I can only see that improving in the future. Fantastic. Are there any, are there any sort of you talk about low-hanging fruit. Are there any priorities you'd really like to uh, to see us move in areas where we have some real potential, but your push will get us on track? Well, you'll certainly see me talk about specifics more after I meet with my counterpart, Director Young, this afternoon. But I will say I'm focusing on some of these areas that I've mentioned in examples already. Uh, for example, transportation, for example, borders. These are areas where both countries really stand to benefit. And just for the record, um, your counterpart, Shalanda Young, is the director of the Office of Management and Budget, within which there's an Office of International Regulatory Cooperation uh, or International Regulatory Affairs, OIRA. But mm -hmm. I only say that because it's Washington, and I want to <laughs> make sure we've covered all of those. <clears throat> Let me ask you one last question. Are there, and then we'll open up to questions from the audience. Are there, um, are there areas where we just won't agree? I'm thinking about uh, what happens when we hit a regulation where the, there's really a substantial difference in how we want to approach it. I'm not sure what that would be, but maybe it's regulatory firearms or something where there's just a different status. What do we do with those? Mm -hmm. Does the RCC then sort of focus on the hard cases and see what can be done? Or is it at least we know each other's regulations and we maintain separate systems? Because I know sovereignty is important to both countries. So has anybody read Cass Sunstein here? Okay. So Cass Sunstein, I'm sure you have. Yeah. Um, so Cass Sunstein writes a lot about the growth of the regulatory state, the administrative state. What does that mean for democracy? It, it, he's done, and a bunch of his colleagues have done great work in this area. It is inconceivable for us to think that we can have identical regulations, given the growth of the administrative state between Canada and the United States. But we can hope for a greater alignment, especially in certain sectors where it is evident that the cost of capital could be lowered with mutual recognition or more regulatory alignment. And that's really the focus that I bring to the table, which is well, we have to be realistic about what we can accomplish, but we have to try uh, to choose certain areas as examples of how mutual recognition and cooperation can occur. But I don't want you to think that this is just starting right now, right? Mm -hmm. I've, I've cited some historical examples where we've already seen gains in regulatory alignment, uh, for example, sunscreen for children, for example, in refrigerators and air conditioners, those are areas where we've already seen progress and we'll continue to see progress through the Regulatory Cooperation Council and increased uh, cooperation between our two countries. Dear for you, but I'll hold back. 
Can I take questions from the audience? We have a great group of students and- uh, I, And friends. I've heard that some of these students are Canadians. There are some Canadian students, so you'll have to fess up if you're Canadian. <laughs> nice. uh, Zavi and then the lady in the back. Sure. Minister, thanks for coming today. I'm curious as to how you see your efforts with the Regulatory Cooperation Council dovetailing with the upcoming USMCA review. Obviously, lots of conversations on regulations in Canada, the US, and Mexico uh, in that upcoming review. But do you see the efforts meeting in any way? Do you see them overlapping? How are you approaching it? So I'm really glad my staff's here today because I really think we need to be coordinated with uh, Minister Ng's office as she goes forward with the UMCA, MCA uh, negotiations. Mm -hmm. Having said that, the issues that we are dealing with in the RCC are prior to a trade dispute level. So we want to ensure that the market for air conditioners functions more efficiently, the market for sunscreen products works more efficiently, the operations at the border are more seamless. The transfer of goods for um, online purchases cross-border is seamless. That type of issue, if resolved in the RCC, doesn't need to be contained in the USMCA. Great, thank you. Hi, Nicole Butler. Uh, I'm actually from Calgary, Alberta, but I'm doing my, I'm this <laughs> I'm year. Doing my master's um, at the School of Foreign Service right Great. now at Georgetown. But I was just wondering, my question's a bit broader in terms of security, but what would be some strategies you would advise the U.S. or the Canadian government or both to almost compartmentalize trade a bit if there's issues that they don't necessarily agree on, regulatory or broader, if there's changes in domestic politics or geopolitics and they just can't align, would you advise compartmentalization to still get certain areas of trade and alignment moving? Or what, what would be your strategies? So the I'm assuming the changes in geopolitics might refer to elections. Yeah, or broader, I mean, just like agreements, disagreements with China or Russia. Right. Or how um, and certainly the level of protectionism in, in different countries has a role to play. Um, Really, the answer to your question is really found in the negotiations. In the negotiations leading up to an announcement, and this is something I didn't see as an academic, right? Because as in, you know, when you're an external observer, of course, all you have to evaluate is the actual announcement and the product that comes out when the countries reach an agreement. But what I have seen in the negotiations themselves is that very point that you're making that there are some issues that can be on the table because of the mutual necessity for two countries to focus on these areas and some issues that are simply not going to be viable at this point in time, given the geopolitical or political situation at play. And I think that is, again, that's realistic and a important way to view what is possible in negotiations. And we have to make sure that we're being pragmatic or we won't get anything done. Like if, if we were uh, wholly idealistic and we simply said, it's my way or the highway, these are the issues we have to address. I don't think you would see as much progress as you're going to be seeing over the next few weeks and months from the RCC. Thank you. Uh, Richard. Okay. Uh, my name is Rich Sanders. Uh, I had the privilege of serving as Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Ottawa, 2013 to 16. So uh, I do remember vividly the whole regulatory cooperation effort, and I salute you for uh, giving it a new impulse because I think uh, you know, for the last few years it had perhaps uh, kind of run its course. Uh, however, I'm, I'm going to take the liberty of asking you a, a question slightly uh, slightly outside of the regulatory space. Um, um, you served as defense minister where you had the, uh, the role of you know advocating for that sector and um, you know kind of fighting fighting for its budget. Um, as head of the Treasury board, your job is to say no to people a lot, I expect. Um, um, 
Well, it's certainly the case that Canada has made some big purchasing decisions, the F-35, the, the rebuild of the Canadian Navy. Um, those are way for the out years. Um, and in the meantime, in Washington and, and, and in Europe, there remains a perception that, uh, you know, uh, year to year, uh, Canada's defense spending remains, you know, well towards the bottom of the NATO average and in a time when um, the world is getting more complicated. And I, we're certainly well aware of what Canada has done with regard to, to Ukraine and the, uh, the Baltics, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But still, I guess, you know, how do you answer the question in this, in the, you know, in the coming budget, maybe the one after that, uh, is the military getting it to do? So remember the 2% figure is, it's a fraction. Your, your denominator, if large, in terms of GDP, sure. your numerator is going to look smaller. The richer you are, the harder it is to, to meet the 2%. Yes. So I'll put that point, clarification point on the table. And the second point, in absolute terms, Canada has the sixth largest defense budget amongst NATO countries. So it's the ratio that in terms of the 2% that has been um, the challenge for Canada to meet. And I was very pleased to see the prime minister announce at the NATO summit in July that Canada would reach 2% by 2032. And so that's going to mean more and more defense spending at a time where we're already increasing our defense spending by 70% under our current defense policy between 2017 and 2026. Uh, so in other words, defense spending in Canada is increasing. We are going to reach 2%. We are the fifth largest in absolute terms defense uh, budget amongst NATO countries. And that all bodes uh, very well for Canada to continue to show its value and commitment in this area. I will also say that our practical contribution to NATO's eastern flank is uh, tangible. If you look at Canada's leadership in Latvia, for example, uh, we are and have been there for six years as the leader of the multinational battle group uh, comprised of the most countries of any of the multinational battle groups on the eastern flank. Um, put that together with the F-35 uh, purchases, the purchase of 15 surface combatants being built by Canadian shipyard. We are well positioned to continue to be strong in this area. And you will see this change over time in a positive way. Thank you. I, I had the pleasure of working at the Pentagon and I can tell you that they loved working with their Canadian counterparts. I will say that uh, is it, Lloyd Austin, Secretary Austin holds a special place in my heart for the cooperation that we had when I was defense minister. Um, he came to the Halifax Security Forum. Uh, I still think after I called him and said, we'd really love to have you here. And uh, we will, as countries, continue to build on that type of strong relationship. A quick question on a follow-up going, actually linking to your procurement role. Buying a fighter jet or any of these things must be agonizing. Even I know it is in the US, but you, are, are you getting a good price? Do you understand the complexity? Is there room building on regulatory cooperation for us to do data and as kind of consumers to maybe procure together? Part Here's of the, what we have a plan Biden administration's change. national defense industrial strategy talks about an allied okay. industrial base. Are there ways that we can improve that process of procurement by relying on each other and sharing data? So procurement is difficult, let's just say. It's That's extremely right. time consuming. And uh, the U.S. government has a different role than the Canadian government does in terms of uh, procurements with the private sector. 
And so I, I think sharing data is more difficult in this sector than in others. Uh, but having said that, there have been very useful partnerships. And I'll say, yes, the F-35 purchase was a Gordian knot. It hung over uh, our heads for a decade or so. Uh, but our role as a federal government was to make sure that we were not part of the process in terms of receiving competitive bids, running a competitive process and choosing the ultimate winner, Lockheed Martin, without political involvement. That was Very the well. goal of our government. Uh, and so, as I said, procurement is difficult and it's run differently in different countries. And our choice as a government was to ensure that the politicians weren't making that decision. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Um, I have to go now this question, but thank you, Minister, for coming down this morning to speak to us. Also um, Canadian, by the way. Yeah. Um, so as a follow-up, will, will the government be well, uh, following the same path in terms of not making this a political decision when it comes to our submarine acquisition for the new fleet that's coming up? And the second question I have for you is more specific. It relates to Bill C-27, uh, especially concerning the ADA Act. So um, that regulation does will probably contain segments that will regulate interprovincial uh, and international trade uh, that well, uses artificial intelligence systems. Are we already in talks with the United States um, about regulatory cooperation um, on this subject? So in terms of the submarine purchase, uh, you're usefully raising one of the items that we see in Canada's new defense strategy, which was unveiled in the budget 2024. And the decisions about the acquisition are still being made in the conversations within government. There's been nothing put out to tender and no decision about the type of acquisition that will uh, go forward. So I don't really have a firm answer because we as a government have made a decision on that issue. I will say my predisposition, generally speaking, is where we can run competitions we should uh, because that keeps the costs lower than if you're sole sourcing a contract. But it just, it really depends on the circumstances. In the pandemic, for example, we did need to sole source certain contracts because of the necessity, there was a national emergency. So again, these are the types of considerations that will go into the decision of how that purchase occurs. And then on your second question regarding AI, I'm so glad you raised AI. We um, are having a round table on AI at the embassy today. And artificial intelligence, in terms of its use in the government, falls under my portfolio. So I'm actually now in the process of crafting an AI strategy for the public sector, which we hope will be ready by uh, the spring of next year. Uh, the IDA that you mentioned that is contained, it's actually funding was contained in Budget 2024 for this center, uh, is it extremely important, not just for uh, AI's utilization cross-border, but for the purposes of ensuring that the privacy considerations that must be taken into account when we're using uh, AI, regardless of the sector, are present. And so that center is just getting up and running also. Uh, so I think I should come back here and give you a guys an update on all of these files uh, sometime soon. And hopefully I'll have more to, to tell you about the center and the submarine purchase. Fantastic. Uh, Tiffany. Um, Tiffany Cox, State Department. Uh, I cover the trade and investment portfolio, um, and I just joined the Canada file about a year ago. So this will be my first RCC experience. Um, so I'm curious from your perspective, what went wrong last time with the RCC process and what will change, I guess, under your leadership. Um, and then separately, you mentioned, again, this is my first RCC process, that you're expecting progress over the next few weeks and months. What does that look like in terms of discussions with the US? What are the key, I guess, deadlines? Is it an ongoing process over years or months? Just curious. Okay, so on the first question, nothing went wrong. Okay. The pandemic hit oh. and the priorities of the government shifted to the purchase of PP rapid tests and vaccines and taking care of Canadian citizens. 
And so that project, like many others, just lay dormant. And so this is post pandemic that I am saying it's time to revive this, especially as we proceed to the next election and beyond in the United States. But I will say what's so important is that the RCC has survived through multiple elections in both countries since 2011. It has the stability and meets a purpose which government officials on both sides of the border see as being important to enhance the Canada-US trade relationship of $3.3 billion flowing across the border every single day. In terms of your second question, um, which was... About what deadlines look like? Yeah, no, okay. So the... the I, I just want to say, I want to shout out to my staff here and hopefully they'll pass that on to the other folks I work with. I came in guns a blazing on the end of January. I said, I, there's this thing called the RCC and we're going to get going with it and we're going to enhance regulatory cooperation. We're going to decrease costs for business. Everyone's kind of looking at me like, what is she talking about? I get that because, every day at the office. Because we have $450 billion of federal expenditures and a spending review where we have to cut costs ac across government on our plates. So what is she talking about? And so my staff actually listened and the department listened and saw the value in reducing costs for businesses and achieving greater regulatory alignment. And that brings me to the timeline, which you asked about. So I came in there the end of January and had this conversation. Between January and June, we held multiple roundtables. I listed the cities, met with hundreds of businesses, developed the itinerary for a meeting with Shalanda Young, which occurred in June and then, or the end of May. And then in June, uh, we actually had a joint press release, June 11th, June 12th, where we stated we are developing our work plan for the next round of negotiations in the RCC. And I'm actually meeting with her again this afternoon to further that work and uh, hopefully finalize some of the topics that we'll be focusing on. But I, I, I want, since you're at the State Department now and you're hopefully gonna be watching this, you to hopefully take back that this isn't just a one and done. If this is in this round, in the upcoming rounds, we will continue to have an opportunity to look at different areas that we will need to bring into the purview of the RCC. And that's regardless of the outcome of elections, because we've seen the RCC being successful over more than a decade, and that will continue. Here um, in the U.S., because we have branches that play check and balance roles, unlike Canada, where the executive and the legislative are, are right. together, there's really a focus um, a lot of times on what's within executive authority. We've had a couple of big Supreme Court decisions. Um, I think about the Alina decision, because that said you must push things through rulemaking. You can't sort of say, oh, it's just a minor tweak. Yet more agencies have to go through the formal regular rulemaking process. And then Chevron which was a decision that discouraged, uh, said, well, we're not just not going to defer to, you, to an agency They, in interpreting the rules. You have to justify everything, which I think together may slow down the U.S. process. Are you watching that at all? I know we're still figuring out what it means for our governance, but um, I guess that's the first question I have, a bit technical. Most definitely. Um, but the Chevron decision doesn't have a counterpart in Canada, right? So we have seen kind of a divergence of the growth of the administrative state in each country, perhaps because of the difference in parliamentary structure, but also the difference in the types of decisions that our respective Supreme Courts and lower courts are making. Um, having said that, we both obviously have a commitment to the growth of the democratic state. 
and the perpetuation of the institutions that are the foundation of a democratic state. And those include um, courts that run without interference and a press that is not politicized and can run and publish freely, uh, unencumbered. Um, and so those types of institutions, I think, are what really bind our countries together, the respect for institutions. And they should be, in my opinion, the, the driver of our decisions that we make um, when we go to the polls. You'll know the, um, the U.S. regulatory process is governed by something called the Administrative Procedures Act. And I know there are a lot of people thinking about how do we modify that to take some of these decisions into account. And one of the things that's interesting about the Administrative Procedures Act, there is something interesting about it, those of you students who are doubtful, uh, is that it, it bars officials from talking to people outside government prior to the publication of a proposed rule in, in the uh, Federal Register, because it wants to make sure that government's process of deciding what it wants to do is, is kept away from mm -hmm. lobbying. Mm -hmm. Once it's published in the Federal Register, it goes through notice and comment, and that's the point at which we yeah. get involved. Canada is a different system. The time when it goes dark is when it goes to cabinet for approval, when a rule gets to that level. Do you think there's potential? Well, I guess maybe that's too soft a question, but can we allow each other to have sort of windows on those processes, at least government to government? So for example, while we're developing rules, say, okay, we're not supposed to talk to the lobbyists, but maybe we can talk to the Canadians so that we have this conversation and we can do things together. Ultimately up to Congress, but I wonder sometimes if those are the kinds of tools we'll need to see. So for your I, don't, I don't know what goes into US decision-making, but I'll tell you from a Canadian perspective, I do not believe that we would be um, able to breach cabinet confidence unless uh, it was necessary for the movement of that. Right particular piece of business so luckily that's at the end of the process I, I worry the U.S. has that dark period before at the very foundational side of rulemaking and that might be the thing that we need to pierce the veil it's with. interesting because I am thinking about where my writing will go once I leave government and go back to academia and certainly this governance issue is one very fertile area. Um, I, I will just use this opportunity though to say that I, I am concerned with leaks as a yeah. general matter. I will say that um, a government cannot function properly when individuals from within the government are deciding to reveal information to the media. And we have had instances numerous instances of this over the past two to five years. Certainly I saw it in defense. Uh, we are seeing it in uh, various issues, including foreign interference in Canada. And that concerns me deeply. And I always go back to my uh, departmental team and say, this is unacceptable. Uh, we need to be on top of it and get on top of it. But sometimes in this age of uh, virtual communication, it's very difficult to trace the leak. Um, but I, I worry about leaks a lot. And so the more tight decision making is, the, the more secure it is, and perhaps the better it is. That's a very good point. Richard, you have another question, but let me ask the young lady next to you first, just because she hasn't asked a question yet. I'll make it quick. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And sorry for being late. I was at the Wilson Center. Um, <laughs> I very much appreciate you being here. Emilia from 3M Company. We have a big presence in the US, of course, where we're from, but also in Canada, a very important market to us. And one of the things that are really important to us moving forward is, of course, the stability of that trade. We move goods across the border constantly many more times that you would imagine to the benefit of, of both economies. I wonder, because I was late, you might have talked about border clearance and sort of how you see that moving forward. And then I was also wondering how can U.S. businesses having a strong presence here in D.C. and elsewhere in Ottawa, how can we help your agenda to have a, you know, a smooth renewal of the USMCA um, on both sides? So I'm not sure exactly when you came in, but it, I did talk a little bit about 
greater efficiency at the border as being a priority of the Regulatory Cooperation Council. Really glad to hear about your being at 3M. Uh, one example of the great cooperation between Canada and the US was actually relating to 3M and 95 masks. Uh, I was at procurement at the time. We had a contract with 3M for the uh, importation from the US of 3M masks every month. Those uh, imports were in jeopardy once the pandemic hit and we had to uh, engage in intense negotiations to ensure that we were able to receive those 3M masks. But that was the first time I ever tracked a truck with products in it going across the border on my phone. I remember those days, yeah. <laughs> so all that to say that it really drove home to me in my first few months of being in government of the importance of allowing our border to function as efficiently as possible. So you will hear us uh, ensuring that that continues to happen. And then I'll just say that at Treasury Board, I am responsible for 300,000 federal employees. And there was a threat of a strike at the border in June. And I uh, and my team at Treasury Board ensured that that's, that uh, collective agreement was settled and concluded without there being a strike. And again, never before have I had so many officials from the United States and Canada calling me all at the same time because a strike would have been so detrimental to our cross-border trade relationship. Thank you. Maybe we'll do just one more question and then we can do a group photo if that works. Oh, yeah, that's a group of photos. Yes. <laughs> um, Richard, you had your hand up. Okay, well, my my question actually overlapped tremendously with what was said before. Um, uh, I so I have two other people ask a question if you'd like. I mean, <laughs> but you can go ahead. I, um, it'll be speed round. Yeah, speed round. That's right. It really, it, 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 because everything does sort of come down to the border one way or another when you're dealing with U.S. Canadian relations. Um, uh, we've, you've got these, you know, operational agencies: DHS, Public Safety in Canada. That, the trade types, et cetera. What is, what is the Treasury Board and the regulatory role with regard to kind of keeping, you know, balancing security and, and um, you know, facilitating trade, trade and, and movement? Of the border? Where do you come in? My role is not on the security front mm -hmm. in terms of the day-to-day -day security at the border, other than ensuring that we have the public servants at the border to do their job. That's important. But <clears throat> as I said, we ensured that that happened in June with the signing of a collective agreement and no strike. Uh, so we move on now to the second part of your question, which is ensuring that trade occurs. Our role is on the regulatory alignment side of things. The negotiation of the NAFTA will be over and above the Role, role of the RCC. Um, but your, your comment does raise the important point that government departments can operate in silos. That doesn't really make sense for uh, me to proceed with the RCC and Mary Ng to proceed with the NAFTA negotiations. We've got to bring this together within government and ensure that there's no duplication because duplication will also be costly. Uh, so after this round of the RCC, I will be meeting with Mary Ying. My team will meet with her team to ensure that the NAFTA negotiations exclude the items that we have settled in the RCC. Fantastic. Hannah, Ian, speed, speed round. Thank Start you. with Hannah. Um, hi, Hannah from RBC here in the U.S. Um, and my question is on all of our minds here are the 2024 elections coming up here in the U.S., um, what do you see as the future for the RCC, depending on that result, specifically at the presidential level? So and before we go, okay. I'll get to yeah, question, okay. then we wrap up. Yes. And uh, um, as Canadians who uh, study at SICE and in, in, in the United States who want to go into public service in Canada in the future, do you have any advice for, for us? Career okay, great. Mm -hmm. okay. So in terms of the elections, there should be no difference, regardless of who is uh, in the White House in November or January, we have an election in Canada in October, 2025, similar point. 
the RCC has survived uh, President Obama, President Trump, President Biden, and we're here now, and it will continue to survive after the next election in the US. In Canada, same thing, Prime Minister Harper, Prime Minister Trudeau. Uh, so I, I, I want to focus really on the strength of the relationship. It's the relationship, it's the cross border businesses that have continued to operate regardless of the election cycle that will continue to make sure that the RCC has importance and relevance. So thank you for the question. And then in terms of the public service, uh, the, the public service is a very dynamic, amazing place to work. And I would encourage you to just get some contact information from my team here, who will ensure that you can meet with people in the departments that you're thinking of applying to, so that you get a sense of what it is like to work in the public service. Um, it's so broad, 300,000 people that I couldn't really start naming all of the different areas. Uh, but we do also have a school of public service that once you are a public servant, regardless of the department, you can enroll in different courses and benefit from whether it's language courses or cyber security courses or uh, courses relating to equity and diversity in the public service, there are uh, avenues for higher learning once you uh, once you arrive at the public service. So hopefully you'll find a home. Uh, and the good there. news is that uh, Taiki Sarantakis, who's the president of the Canada School of Public Service, is coming on Monday. It's a little commercial oh, where he's good. going to talk about how public sector recruitment works and oh, what's great. the right channel for you. So we great. do that for all the students here in Washington. I didn't even Everyone's know going. that. Yeah. <laughs> set it up. There it is. You perfectly, beautifully. <laughs> Minister, this was a fantastic conversation as every one of my conversations with you no, is. You, and it must be you because not all my conversations are good. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much no, for coming. No, I mean